Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second annual State of the Schools event hosted by Evanston Skokie School District 65 and 202. My name is John Price, and I serve as the Assistant Superintendent of Schools for District 65. Last year marked the first time in recent history that superintendents from both districts took the stage to share an update with you on our schools. Colleagues from both districts work together every day throughout the school year to provide students of Evanston and Skokie with a world-class education. The goal of helping every child reach his or her potential. We're excited to continue tonight's tradition and to share the important work that is being done in our schools. We are honored to have Evanston May Evanston's Mayor Tisdall with us this evening, as well as many city officials, aldermen, business partners, legislatures, and community leaders. Mayor Tisdall, I don't know if you'd like to stand so we can recognize you. Thank you very much for being here. We would also like to recognize members of the District 65 and District 202 school boards. Would you all please stand? We'd also like to thank our colleagues from Northwestern University and Oakton Community College for being here this evening. I'd like to give a special welcome to our faculty and staff who are here. And a welcome to the many District 65 and ETHS alumni who are here tonight. There aren't too many places in this country where more than 16,000 alumni from the city's only public high school live and work in the community where they grew up. Many of you have children in our schools. Many of you have come back to work or volunteer in our schools. No matter how you have chosen to stay connected, we'd like to thank you for your ongoing support and your commitment to your alma maters. Finally, I'd like to thank the communications offices of District 202 and 65 for helping put this event together. This event itself and how it has come together is a symbol of the collaborative work happening between both districts. Let me tell you about the agenda for this evening. After a uh, brief video highlighting the collaborative work of both districts, uh, we'll hear of the State of the Schools address presented by Superintendent Paul Gorin from District 65, followed by Superintendent Witherspoon from District 202. Finally, we'll end the program with a question and answer session moderated by Janet Webb, a former teacher in both District 65 and 202. Throughout the event, we encourage you to share your thoughts on Twitter using the hashtag Evanston Schools. And if you're in the audience tonight or watching from home, you can use your mobile device to submit questions at any time during the program. Simply text the word Evanston Schools, all one word, no spaces, to 22333 to join and then start texting your questions. Or you can submit your question via the internet by logging on to the web address shown on the screen. You do not need to log in nor register to submit a question. And for those of you who'd prefer pen and paper, raise your hand at this time and you may request an index card and a pen. And one of the ETHS student ambassadors in the teal shirts will be happy to help you. Please remember that not every question can be responded to tonight during the Q&A session. Now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Marcus Campbell, Assistant Superintendent and Principal at Evanston Township High School, who will share some quick facts about our school districts. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Marcus Campbell, and I have the opportunity and the pleasure of serving the students and staff and the families of ETHS. There are two public school districts in Evanston, Illinois. District 65 is a pre-kindergarten through eighth grade school district with 18 schools, and District 202 is a one school district for students in grades nine through 12. What our public school districts 
educate students from all over the city of Evanston, as well as students who live in a neighboring portion of Skokie. Our school, our district attendance area is home to Northwestern University and Oakton Community College, as well as a variety of manufacturing districts, local and global businesses, such as the Rotary International and many faith-based and community organizations. Collectively, Evanston Skokie Public Schools employ more than 2,000 adults, many of whom are from or live in the Evanston and Skokie communities. And we work together to educate more than 10,000 students in this community. Nearly half of, stu of the students in both districts live in households that qualify for free or reduced lunch. And we provide a robust portfolio of special education services to more than 1,400 students through the age of 22. We are proud to be a part of a community that celebrates public education, and we work hard to ensure our fiscal solutions will support academic achievement and student well-being for years to come. Our public school system in Evanston has students from various cultural backgrounds, representing a large number of countries from all over the world and speaking a number of languages other than English. Students and both districts are from various racial backgrounds as well, with students of color making up the majority of the student body as shown on this slide. As we know that this diverse environment helps to prepare students for a wide array of experiences after they leave our classrooms. And by inviting unique perspectives and fostering open dialogue in our school community, the learning that takes place will benefit our students for the rest of their lives. Before we begin our State of the Schools address, we'd like to share a brief video highlighting the collaborative work between Districts 65 and 202. Hello. I'm Eric Witherspoon, Superintendent of Evanston Township High School District 202. And in this video, you'll hear about the collaborative work happening in Evanston's award-winning pre-K through public high school districts. Whether you're considering moving to our school community or have been a lifelong resident, we hope you'll enjoy the opportunity to learn about some of our dynamic cross-district partnerships, as well as our shared commitment to building a brighter future for all students. Hi, I'm Paul Gorin, Superintendent of Evanston Skokie School District 65. I appreciate this opportunity to talk about the vision for progress and educational excellence that we expect for every school-aged child in this community, from their first day of pre-K to the day they walk across a graduation stage in cap and gown. We understand the importance of this continuum in each school district. In District 65, we are inspired by the importance of focusing on every child, every day, whatever it takes. This has become more than just our slogan, but a daily call to action. We spent the better part of a year listening and learning from members of our community to develop our strategic plan. Embedded within our plan are opportunities to focus on the achievement of all students and to strengthen partnerships with District 202 and other community organizations for the benefit of all children. For many years, we have worked alongside our colleagues in District 202 to share data and resources to help foster a smooth transition for eighth graders into high school. Our goals are to prepare all children to be ready for their high school experience at ETHS and ultimately to be college and career ready. High quality teaching and learning is also a key part of our collaboration. Together, our districts have implemented a joint literacy initiative to improve reading performance and help ensure students are on track for reading readiness at every grade level. As teachers share their knowledge and skills throughout this initiative, we hope that over time, we can apply the success to other academic areas. For the first time this school year, Dr. Witherspoon and I has published a joint achievement report. We've created a big picture overview to strengthen our efforts around literacy and further guide alignment between the districts, extending to social studies, science, world languages, and bilingual services. Both school districts remain committed to meaningful community engagement and welcome opportunities to be part of solution-oriented initiatives like Cradle to Career. This collective impact effort leverages community resources and offers solutions to educational challenges for students of all ages. 
The professional teamwork between School District 65 and District 202 continues to grow stronger. Our joint board meetings, reporting measures, and our financial collaboration help ensure that we are making the most responsible decisions for all students. By partnering across districts, we're able to create a more equitable and excellent learning community where all students can be inspired to reach their potential while attending Evanston Public Schools. And as we continue to reinvigorate strong ties between the districts, we're also creating a sense of community for students within the school districts. For example, each school year, students from both districts are able to showcase their talents at the collaborative events like the Visual Arts Open House, the Choir and Orchestra Days, and the annual Geometry Bridge Building Competition. Each fall, we host an incoming freshman information night that welcomes over 800 prospective students and their families to the high school. And nearly 80% of our eighth grade guests represent District 65 schools. And in January, both districts host a State of the Schools event to provide the entire community with an opportunity to be heard and be engaged with Evanston's public schools. Both District 65 and District 202 benefit from long-standing partnerships with the City of Evanston, Northwestern University, Oakland Community College, and organizations like the McGall YMCA, the YWCA, YOU, and Family Focus, along with countless other community groups. These collaborations help us to create the best possible learning environments and help us share resources in our classrooms and support programs. Social, athletic, and cultural activities are also a vital part of the school experience for all ages and help provide additional leadership and mentorship opportunities for our students. Programs like Girls Play Sports and the Citywide Kits, Cats, and Kids Community Block Party demonstrate the importance of our district collaborations beyond the classroom. Of course, community and family engagement are at the heart of many efforts in District 65 and District 202. Our families celebrate countless milestones from the first day of kindergarten to the first day of middle school to the final day of high school. And we know that the memories and experiences from all of these milestones are an important part of our communities. We're proud to celebrate future Wild Kits along with today's Wild Kits because we know that Evanston's public school districts make a difference. We have generations of proud graduates from both districts who choose to live, work, and raise their children in Evanston. And we see examples of this pride across the globe as alumni share their experiences of attending Evanston's public schools in their professional and personal networks. We look forward to continuing our collaborative work with the District 65 team in an effort to build a brighter future and inspire a lifelong passion for learning for all children. The professional interactions and commitment of both districts result in educational services geared to meet the needs of every young person who walks through our doors. District 65 and District 202 are fortunate to have a team of dedicated staff members, involved families, and a community that celebrates public education. Thank you for your continued support of our students and our schools. Superintendent Dr. Paul Gorin and ETHS District 202 Superintendent Dr. Eric Witherspoon to the stage. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Marcus. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, I, uh, I enjoyed that video. That worked out very well. Um, good evening. I'm Paul Gorin, and I have the pleasure of serving as superintendent of District 65. I'm a longtime Evanston resident and have children that have attended Oakton and Chute. I have two uh, sons who are here at uh, ETHS and one daughter who graduated several years ago. Um, last fall, we uh, launched an intensive community engagement process to assist with the development of our strategic plan. Over 2,000 people shared their input and ideas. 
We published our strategic plan last March, focusing on five key areas, high quality teaching and learning, thriving workforce, family and community involvement, uh, and community engagement, safe and supportive school climate, and financial sustainability. The input we received from our community to develop this plan was critical. We were able to set priorities and now have a roadmap to guide our work over the next five years. The information that I share this evening exemplifies our journey. A key part of this work was to update our mission statement to reflect our core values of, and vision. We ask ourselves and our community, what is our purpose? What do we stand for? And we heard from parents, teachers, staff members, students, residents, and neighbors on the elements they felt were important and should be reflected in our mission statement. We heard about the importance of fostering creativity, celebrating the arts, and providing every child with the chance to be inspired. Permit me to give you a few highlights of creativity that occurs throughout our district. This past weekend, I attended the Oakton Chess Tournament, which is part of a district-wide effort on scholastic chess. This event represented everything that is excellent about District 65. We had 16 schools, 225 children learning from each other, 100 plus parents, and a full day of competition, celebration, and camaraderie across the schools. The chess club is con considered quite, a, quite special at Oakton and has the highest student participation rate in its nearly 30-year history, 65 members strong. The program and the tournament was a wonderful showcase of the Oakton School community. Students at Haven let their creativity run wild in their fall play straight out of Shakespeare. Contemporary connections were brought to light through the narration written by our collaborative, compassionate, and creative young people. A focus group of eighth graders served as dramaturgs and playwrights to interpret some of Shakespeare's most well-known uh, scenes. Over 140 students, both on stage and behind the scene, scenes, brought Shakespeare's stories to life in several live performances. With no adults backstage, this student-led production exemplified student leadership at its best. Thanks to a $640,000 grant from the Noyce Foundation for Evans STEM, District 65 is partnering with colleagues here in District 202, Northwestern, and organizations around our community to expand STEM opportunities for underrepresented and underperforming students. Our goal is to provide new and inspiring experiences in the area of science, technology, engineering, and math. This work has been nationally recognized, and we are one of 27 communities and only three public school districts in the, in the United States selected to be part of the National STEM Ecosystems Initiative. Our community stressed to us during the strategic plan to you uh, the importance of high quality teaching and learning and the critical task of supporting all learners. In this regard, I would like to share a story about a student named Calvin, who is pictured on the left in the slide. Calvin is an energetic uh, first grader at Washington Elementary. He started the year reading with reading and writing skills significantly below his peers. Calvin was easily frustrated and struggled with print and classroom instruction. His teacher, Kathy Doyle, recommended that he be screened for reading recovery support. For two months, Calvin received daily one-to-one -one instruction with a highly trained reading specialist, while Ms. Doyle provided engaging and explicit classroom instruction. During this time, Calvin also participated in a home reading challenge, reading a total of 100 books in 10 weeks. After Thanksgiving, he was tested and had caught up with the rest of his peers in reading and writing. Our teachers, like Kathy Doyle, are going above and beyond to help their students grasp important concepts. They continually find ways to provide enriching experiences for children. This is apparent by the next story I'm going to share. Kingsley teacher Pam Weir is committed to leading her students through experiences that help them deepen their understanding of the origins and significant changes in our community. As part of her second grade curriculum, students learn social studies concepts through the lens of the local community. Ms. Weir designed an interactive notebook that includes images, content, and activities about our changing geography, a look at the N Native American people who were first residents of this area, and major events that shaped the founding and development of Evanston. 
Ms. Weir demonstrates a deep commitment to making this experience of studying the history of Evanston an active and engaging task. We love her ongoing commitment to better meet the needs, needs of her students. As part of our strategic planning process, we heard a clarion call from our community to embrace not only academic, but also social and emotional learning. It was clear that our families want our young people to become effective decision makers as they deal with a wide range of circumstances in their lives. This year, we convened a whole child council comprised of school and central office staff members and community leaders. The council is charged with continuous improvement of services related to whole child development, including academic progress, social emotional learning, disciplinary strategies, and cultural responsiveness. The Whole Child Council supports school climate teams that are being phased into all of our schools over the next several years. We are also implementing restorative justice practices, including sharing and peace circles. I want to tell a quick story about what this looks like in one of our schools. A teacher from King Arts had little knowledge of restorative justice practices, but when introduced to the idea, she felt she could take a risk and try something. She developed a partnership with a volunteer student from Northwestern University to help implement a sharing circle in her classroom. Each day, the students join in a circle to share their thoughts and feelings about a particular topic. The topics are designed to get students talking and to build a sense of, of community in the classroom. The circle also gives the teacher a sense of climate. The circle started off slowly and not so easy to manage. However, over time, they started noticing changes in the, their students' behavior, listening more intently, and even, even learning how to respectfully agree and disagree. She now uses sharing circles as a daily practice for students to get in touch with each other. This teacher believes that her circles are helping to transform their relationships in her classroom in a positive way and helps her to connect to the lives of the students. The work that is done in our classrooms and schools is supplemented by strong partnerships with our friends here in District 202 and with organizations like Foundation 65, YOU, the Evanston Public Library, the YMCA and the YWCA, Family Focus, Northwestern, and many others. Together, we are making every effort to prepare our children for future success and to be positive contributors to our global society. Every child, every day, whatever it takes, is not only the culminating part of our mission statement, but a daily call to action. We have nearly 1,400 staff members in District 65 who play a variety of important roles to help our children day in and day out. We have a team of teachers, administrators, and support staff who are genuinely committed to helping all students achieve. I am grateful to call them colleagues and would publicly like to thank them for their work. Our talented team serves a diverse student body across 18 schools. I'd like to provide a quick overview of our schools and some of our programs. In District 65, we serve a wide range of ethnic, racial, socioeconomic, and cultural backgrounds. District 65 has 10 attendance areas, uh, 10 attendance area elementary schools that feed into our three middle schools serving sixth through eighth grade students. We have two magnet schools, an early childhood center, a self-contained special education school funded jointly by District 65 and District 202, and the Rice Education Center, a therapeutic day school and residential program. We have two terrific magnet schools that draw students from throughout the district. They offer a continuous school experience for students in grades K through eight. Each school has a specialized focus. As you can see from the slide, Bessie Rhodes celebrates cultural influences from, from around the globe and is built on four, four pillars, science and technology, community service, language and, language and geography. The school also offers Spanish and Mandarin Chinese. King Arts has a special emphasis on integrating the arts across curricular areas and promotes literacy and fine arts activities both during and after the school day. Oakton Elementary, District, uh, District 65 has two magnet programs that serve students across the district. Oakton Elementary is home to the African-centered curriculum program. The ACC features lessons and activities that engage students in African and African-American history. Small class sizes and strong family involvement help students to develop a deeper understanding of these rich cultures. We are committed to implementing culturally irrelevant teaching practices throughout the district. 
Shute, Lincolnwood, and Willard schools have identified this as their main focus for this year and have begun professional development for teachers and administrators teaming with the ACC program at Oakton. The district also offers several programs to support our English language learners. <clears throat> Excuse me. These programs support over 1,500 students who speak 67 different languages. A number of students are enrolled in our two-way immersion Spanish-English program, commonly known as TWI. Spanish is the predominant teaching language in the earliest grades in TWI and gradually shifts to English as students matriculate through the program. Applications are currently available for our magnet schools and our programs. In District 65, we understand the importance of school readiness in supporting our youngest learners. The Joseph E. Hill Early Childhood Center offers a variety of programs that serve children from birth through age five. There are also programs that support pregnant women and parents. Last July, District 65 was named a Head Start grant recipient by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The district will receive $13.25 million over the next five years to support, uh, to support and to uh, expand early childhood programming. Many of the programs at JES are at, at JEH are at no cost to our families. There are still openings in the program and families are encouraged to contact the center for more information. Our schools throughout the district offer, offer a wide range of services to support students with special needs. District 65 currently provides special education services to over 1,000 students. A dedicated team of professionals work to address students' cognitive and behavioral needs. In addition to self-contained classrooms, District 65 has adopted an inclusion model across all schools to create and establish a collaborative, supportive, and nurturing environment. Students with special education needs are educated in the general setting alongside their peers. This provides students with the opportunity to see themselves as participating members of the school community in academics and academic and, and extracurricular activities. District 65 also operates Park School, which is jointly funded by District 65 and District 202. Park, Park School serves students ages three through 22 who benefit from an intensive therapeutic environment. I can say firsthand that there is nothing more enjoyable than Park's Thanksgiving celebration or more, more moving than the Park graduation ceremony. This is a testament to the wonderful teachers and specialists who call Park home. District 65 offers many wonderful programs and services to facilitate the academic and social and emotional growth of our children. The district's financial sustainability is critical to support these offerings in safe, updated buildings. The district is responsible for a budget totaling $124 million. 75% of this revenue comes from local property tax dollars. The budget supports our strategic plan and our instructional and operational goals. A strong financial position is necessary to support these efforts across the district. We are concerned, as my colleagues at 202 are, about the financial outlook in the coming years. Like many other public school districts in this state, we are facing looming deficits and uncertainty at the state level. We have found ways to balance our budget for the upcoming fiscal year. However, beginning in 2017 and 2018, uh, District 65 is facing multi-million dollar deficits that must be addressed at the structural level. We are committed to engaging our community around budget conversations and long-term planning. We are taking great strides to, find, to make our financial documents more accessible and understanding, uh, understandable. Last fall, we uh, developed a budget at a glance document that breaks down the fiscal year 16 budget. This is currently available on our website. It is important that we are proactive in addressing the projected deficits, working collaboratively with our community to find solutions. We are currently conducting a careful analysis of revenues and expenditures to create efficiencies wherever possible. We cut personnel and non-personnel related costs to the budget uh, to balance this year's budget and to reduce any deficits for next year. We remain focused on transparency to help our community better understand the budgeting process and how and why decisions are made. While there are challenges that must be addressed, we remain committed to the achievement of all students. 
On the whole, District 65 students far outperform their national peers. 50% of students score at or above the 70th national percentile in reading on the math assessment. That percentage is even higher in mathematics. Even though we have fewer children in the lower quartile than our national peers, we still have a significant number of students who are struggling. Black and Hispanic students, as well as students living in low-income households, are overrepresented in the lowest quartile of performance. After four years of decline, the 2015 achievement data offers some positive signals. Achievement scores have flattened and, in some cases, slightly improved in reading and math. Black and Hispanic students are making gains at approximately the same rate as their white peers. The same is true for students from low-income households compared to those from higher-income households. Yet, this growth has not been enough to make progress in closing our achievement gap. This year, we transitioned to the new state assessment known as PARC. This assessment is aligned to the Common Core standards, which are considered more challenging than the previous Illinois learning standards. Although our results exceed the state average, our performance is seemingly lower than the old ISAT. This did not come as a surprise and was expected given the greater demands of the Common Core, the higher bar set by PARC, and the low bar Illinois had previously set for proficiency on the ISAT. Even though our high-performing students are doing well, with slightly less than one half of students meeting or exceeding standards, we have a great deal of work to do. There are significant gaps in achievement that must be addressed with heightened urgency. As educators, we all have responsibility to serve all students, especially those who are struggling. In December, over 100 parents, community members, and neighbors attended our school board meeting to express their concerns over student achievement. They issued a call to action to address the widening achievement gap and push the district to provide more and better support for black and African American students. I heard these concerns. Our school board, our administrators, and our teachers heard these concerns. And we share in the deep sentiments expressed by our families and community members. Within our strategic plan are strategies designed to address the achievement gap. We will do everything we can to make a difference for all students. We are ready and willing to work with our families and our community partners. Our next steps must be a balance of immediate action and long-term strategy. While we have a solid plan in place, we also have to admit that there is not one simple solution, one silver bullet, and if one existed, if something like that existed, we would implement it immediately. We must work together, hand in hand with our teachers, principals, families, and community partners to make a real and lasting difference in the lives of all kids. In this regard, we are taking the following actions that fall into three categories. Interventions and supports for struggling learners, creating and maintaining a welcoming environment where all students and families feel like valued members of the community, and continuing to dialogue to strengthen partnerships within the community. First, the district remains committed to implementing interventions and supports for struggling learners. We have identified all students at or below the 25th percentile in reading and will work with our principals to set improvement goals for these students. We will also monitor students between the 26th and 50th percentiles. We regularly share with our colleagues here at ETHS a list of students who are landing at the high school in need of intervention. We will continue to work together with our colleagues across both districts on specific interventions. We will fine tune our interventions in kindergarten through second grade for black, African American, and Hispanic and Latino students in need of additional support. Second, we will continue our work to create and maintain a welcoming environment for our students and our families. We will continue to implement and expand culturally relevant teaching. We are committed to increasing the diversity of our staff and to expand our recruiting efforts to proactively identify teacher and administrator candidates. We are also developing a plan for district-wide diversity training, which will focus on race and racism. We will continue our school climate work and increase social and emotional learning opportunities within our schools. And lastly, we are committed to engaging partners within our community. 
This spring, we will convene advisory committees on African American and Latino Hispanic student achievement. We will also convene a group of students of color from both District 65 and District 202 to hear their thoughts and their concerns. We recognize that we cannot do this work alone and are grateful for our continued partnerships across Evanston and Skokie. This year, we welcomed a family and community engagement coordinator to better understand community issues and to help strengthen these relationships. In the coming month, she will host a series of community conversations to learn how we can improve school climate and programs and services to better meet the needs of students and families. It is clear that we have challenges we must face head on in the coming year and, and years. We must significantly increase growth in the number of students meeting college and career readiness benchmarks. We must address the opportunity and achievement gaps evident by race, socioeconomic status, students with special needs, and English language learners. We remain committed to ensuring our district's long-term financial sustainability by proactively addressing budget challenges. However, with challenge comes opportunity. District 65 has the unique strengths of a, of, of a diverse urban and suburban school system. We have dedicated educators committed to supporting every child every day, whatever it takes. We believe if we can successfully implement our strategic plan, it will make a significant impact on our students, our families, and our schools. We regularly monitor our progress and are committed to transparency on the successes and challenges that we face. We have involved families who are active participants in their children's education and regularly work alongside our teachers and administrators to enhance the school experience for all children. This is a unique time for District 65 and all of our community. Our efforts are aligned with that of ETHS and our partners at Northwestern and the city are eager to assist us in a variety of ways. With efforts like Cradle to Career, coupled with partners throughout the community, we are poised to make a difference. I believe we are positioned to be successful. And I believe that we have the right people working together in the best interest of our children. We have strong partners, involved families, and terrific teachers like James Schomburg, 2015 Golden Apple recipient for excellence in teaching, all working together to make a difference in the lives of all kids. Despite our challenges, we have identified opportunities for growth and look forward to the exciting work ahead. Every day, there are great things happening within our schools, and we have much to be proud. From the Oakton Chess Tournament to the, to the students who are bringing the words of Shakespeare to life at Haven. From the shoot and King Arts students using the power of technology to fuel creativity in the Digital Promise program to the use of culturally relevant teaching practices at Lincolnwood. From the annual diner sponsored and organized by Mr. Heidi's Kindergarten at Kingsley to the Edible Garden at Dawes, we stand committed to keeping the state of our schools strong and thriving. Thank you very much for your continued support. And now it's a, my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce my colleague and my friend, Dr. Eric Witherspoon. Well, I know that we're reporting on both school districts this evening, but forgive me, I have to say it. It's a great day to be a wildcat. <laughs> And we are so pleased to have you here this evening. Uh, you know, as I'm, I'm looking at this this evening, and I know that there are people uh, streaming as well, and I'm listening to Paul uh, share all of the important things going on in District 65, I can't help but think that, first of all, in Evanston, I would, I would dare say that the top priority in this community is the education of our youth. I just know that people move here for that reason, People live here for that reason, and people, after their children have gone out through the school district, stay here for that reason. And it's really interesting. I was thinking, Paul, when, when you were talking, you know, we, we just don't talk the talk. We walk the walk. 
uh, you entrusted your children to District 65 and then to ETHS. And in fact, his two sons are here right now and, and uh, just thriving. Uh, I have a, a nephew and two nieces in District 65 and two grandsons in District 65. And I can tell you as a grandparent and as an uncle, we are certainly happy and satisfied customers. Uh, it, it's a credit to what goes on in this community and it's a credit to what, what we do as a community uh, to not only emphasize and value education, but to make sure we provide top flight education. So let me share a few things with you about uh, ETHS, if I may. Uh, uh, first of all, just, just a quick overview. Uh, you know, our goal is to inspire lifelong passion for learning uh, uh, every day through uh, 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 equity and excellence at ETHS. We do this by preparing our students with life skills that they're going to need to be critical thinkers and higher level thinkers in our society. And we provide them with a variety of opportunities, uh, not only inside but outside the classroom uh, in the arts and the sports and the activities. And if I get to a little bit of that this evening, uh, I'll dazzle you with all the opportunities that young people have outside of the classroom at ETHS. We also inspire a passion for learning by providing our staff with opportunities for team building, professional development, and their own learning. And we have a huge investment in that here because we know that, you, that you know, we keep retooling ourselves, we keep retooling our, our workforce, we keep growing because this world is changing rapidly and not only must our, our students keep up, but we as adults need to be sure that we keep up as well. And we do this by bringing parents and members of the community into our school as partners in education. And maybe uh, uh, just one little small evidence of that is uh, it, if you've not seen it, you'll, you'll have a chance other times when you're here to see it. We even built a welcome center for our parents and community. And we now have a beautiful space uh, to accommodate parents and community so that when they come in here, there is a space for them, there is a, a space they can camp out, there is a space they can meet, there's a space that they can even get some, some coffee and refreshments. And we do this through equity and excellence. And I'll be talking more about, about how we do that and why that's so important. But we do that with, with, by an inspired and supported and, and empowered environment for our students so they build a vision for what it's going to take for them to be successful, not only at this highly challenging high school, but in their futures. So let me highlight a few things about ETHS. First of all, uh, uh, as you've already heard this evening, we have uh, uh, over 3,000 students, uh, and, uh, uh, and of that enrollment, uh, we continue to see an increase in enrollment in all uh, 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 of the areas. Uh, students of all races uh, are, are uh, coming to us in greater numbers every year. Not huge numbers, you know, maybe 50, 60 more kids every year, but it's very proportionate to our, our uh, student distribution, and it is steady. So District 65, thank you for continuing to build enrollments. I know you have uh, growing enrollments, and we're seeing those reflect here at ETHS as well. And we are also seeing an increase uh, enrollment in our students in special education. And we uh, have an extremely large and dedicated special education staff because we understand, and you mentioned inclusive environments, that, that, that special education is, is, is a way to give even more individualized attention to students who are going to benefit from that individualized attention. We offer over 250 courses here, 143 of them are at the honors level. Uh, you can see we, we have 29 advanced placement courses, we ha have uh, uh, pre-engineering courses, uh, we offer certifications in all the areas that you can see, in areas such as culinary, advanced manufacturing, public safety, automotive technology, and by the way, these are national certifications. When you walk out the door with one of these certifications, you are nationally certified. And we have young people right now, today, who have walked straight out of ETHS into very high-powered, very exciting careers, and, and, and frankly, very good uh, uh, incomes 
because of that certification they earned right here at ETHS. Full continuum of services and special ed, and we have an alternative school, and this semester we even added an evening program to that. Got to tell you a quick story. First of all, we're seeing some great results. Our alternative ed program is a little different than a lot of high schools. Uh, our, that program, we don't have that to just uh, uh, maybe uh, 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 shuffle students uh, who are struggling over to another place. It's actually a program to go out and bring back students who have found that they're not succeeding here and in most cases have quit coming. In other words, we are going out and finding dropouts and getting them back in school. And we run full sections every morning and every afternoon at ETHS of young people who otherwise would not be graduating. And when I show you our graduation rate, I think you're going to start to get the picture of, of how it's working. We don't give up on students. But my story about the all evening one is we just started the evening component. And we, um, uh, one of the stories uh, that uh, I, I know just happened within the last couple weeks is we now have a married couple, a married teenage couple, who have an infant who decided that they could now return to the high school and complete the education that they had lost out on. And when I found out a little bit more about it, I, you know, it was like, it turns out it was the husband that, that, that talked his wife into, we can do this, let's go back. Let's, let's, let's get into this alternative program in the evening. And that they actually sat in the car in the parking lot for a half an hour the first night because the husband was convincing his wife they can do this. And they are now coming without fail because they intend to get their high school diplomas. We also offer, as I mentioned, you know, a, a, a amazing num a number of activities. Uh, th this is a moving number, 87 clubs and 31 sports teams. The moving number is the clubs because when students have an idea of something they're interested in, uh, we have ukulele club, you know, we have book club, we have knitting club. If the students have an interest, we find a way to accommodate it. Uh, we also have many state and national awards uh, for our uh, fiscal responsibility our, and reporting, our debate, our math, uh, our science, our, our language arts, our theater, our music, you name it, we are garnering awards all the time. And obviously, we also put a lot of emphasis on, on our school and our facility. Uh, we have uh, been able in the last few years to open up new state-of-the-art STEM labs and actually have a net increase uh, in science labs. Uh, we have a fully equipped transition house for students with special needs who uh, we actually serve until age 22. And after they've completed a, a, a more traditional uh, program here by maybe around age 18 or 19, then we continue to serve them at the transition house so that we can prepare them for career uh, and, and workplace uh, opportunities. Uh, we have, it's not a misprint, for those of you not familiar with ETHS, yes, we do have, in fact, 15 gyms in this school, as well as specialty fitness rooms and that. If you can see that, that's our rock climbing wall, and adjacent to that, in the same room, we have the low ropes, we have the high ropes. They've never managed to get me up there on those yet, even though they do wear a safety harness. <laughs> I don't trust the safety harness, uh, but, but uh, where students can really uh, uh, get exciting experiences uh, here. Uh, I don't know, did I miss one there? I did. Uh, we have a chrome zone, uh, and basically what that amounts to is we have one-to-one -one computing here. Uh, right now, all of our uh, uh, freshmen and sophomores have their own Chromebook. That's their own computer. Think laptop computer. 
Uh, we have retooled how we teach because in classrooms now, uh, students come in, uh, they, they get their Chromebooks out, uh, their assignments, everything are on it. They turn in assignments using their Chromebooks. Uh, 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 different resources are there. Teachers push out resources to them. They collaborate with one another. They push back uh, things to the teacher. They uh, work with each other uh, uh, outside of the classroom using their Chromebooks. And next year, we make that big leap. And by, the, by uh, this coming August, Every student in every grade level at ETHS will have his or her own, uh, their own uh, Chromebooks. So again, uh, why the Chrome Zone then? Well, they do need taken care of we admit per, every so often. Uh, not as often as you'd think, but repairs are needed. Certainly on a given day with, with thousands of them out there, uh, you, you know, we, we get them every day. Uh, they also need assistance or maybe uh, they left their Chromebook at home and they need to check one out for a day, whatever it may be. But what's most important about this is that Chrome Zone repairs, service, assistance, uh, 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 substitute uh, Chromebook if you need it, is operated by students. They get supervised mentoring in order to learn the skills and assist their peers by operating the Chrome Zone, and every kid in the school who has a, a, a Chromebook knows where the Chrome Zone is and knows that they have peers in there every period of the day ready to assist them. We have a student success store, uh, center, it's called the Hub. Uh, uh, if you've not seen it, uh, uh, sign up for one of our campus tours. That alone, when you walk in, you, you won't believe it. You'll think, this is a high school? This is what goes on in, 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 in ETHS, and it's this beautiful picture, uh, a, a student union in a college, uh, this beautiful uh, place with all different kinds of, you know, soft furniture, uh, uh, workstations, technology, you name it, and then a study center for every ac uh, of the core academic areas up there, community service, college and career center, uh, 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 YOU, the youth job center, you name it, we have all those services up there. So not only can you go back into the student center and kick back, you can also get help and you can also get your studying done and you can also get extra academic uh, acceleration. We now offer something called Algebra in Entrepreneurship. Uh, and this is a whole new concept of teaching algebra in the context of how it's work used in the business world. How teams work together, solving problems, identifying problems, understanding how to set up uh, that problem and how they use it uh, in, in, in their daily work life. And here's just one example, and, 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 and you can see this is just one workstation, and they can project their work, and they can work as a team, and, these, and the room has numerous entrepreneurial workstations for them. We have an advanced manufacturing lab. We work with the, the local community, a local manufacturers. Many of them say we're envious. It's unbelievable what you are offering to high school students. It's state of the art. We have 3D printers in there. Uh, we, we, we have machining equipment. We have welding stations. It's unbelievable. But if that isn't enough, come see our planetarium. Now, first of all, there are only a handful of high schools in all of America that have a planetarium. But ours has been here for a long time. We didn't dream it up. Actually, it's been here about 50 years. But until recently, the technology in it dated back to 50 years ago. And we have now completely retooled it. It's a completely digital. It's completely high definition. It's complete surround sound system. And we have much of the most advanced uh, software that you can imagine in there. And it's not only for astronomy uh, and our astrophysics course. Yes, did you hear me? We offer astrophysics. Uh, if you find another high school in America that offers it, let me know, because until then, I'm going to tell you it's the only high school in America offering astrophysics. Uh, uh, and, and, and I got a hunch I'm right. Uh, but we can even do things, for example, we can use this in our class and go in and look at the Sistine Chapel. We can use this in, 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 in a, uh, a biology class, and we can go in there, and we can go inside the human body. 
and about anything you can imagine uh, is possible in today's digital world, we can do it in our planetarium. Oh yeah, and we build houses. We have geometry and construction. It's not simply a crafts course, but you do learn to, to do some things, such as drive a nail. Uh, I, make, I say that in jest. I remember the first year I went in and, and they were doing their first exercise and most of our students had never driven a nail. Uh, I mean, it was, it was really interesting to watch. But let me tell you, by the time they're done, they know how to drive a nail because they build a house. We're now building our third house three years in a row. We build a house every year. The city of Evanston is drop dead fantastic. They work with us to locate lots uh, where additional housing is needed. We work with the folks uh, 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 who, who provide housing in the city of Evanston. We work with the trades. We have business partners. Uh, we, we have uh, actually our, our local lumber yard is unbelievably generous with us. But the fact is every year we build a house uh, uh, behind the high school and then come summer we move it yeah, that's right we move it well we don't <laughs> we have it moved uh, uh, and, and, and put on the site and it becomes affordable housing in Evanston we've added two affordable housing homes so far We're, we've got a, a third on the way and we have a commitment to not only teaching geometry, but teaching geometry and construction. If you look real quickly, I mentioned our graduation rate. Um, uh, we, we have a uh, five-year graduation rate. Actually, that's uh, uh, just uh, uh, jumped up to 91%. That's a, that, that one there's a year old. Uh, we're, we're gaining every year. Uh, and in fact, the latest is uh, our four-year graduation rate, which is what most high schools have to measure, and we do too, is 89%. But our five-year graduation is 91 because back to what I said, we don't let students get away with leaving. We signal them it's okay to be here five years. It, in fact, you belong here. And if you didn't finish, come on back. We're going to go. And, and if, if you didn't think you're coming back, we're going to go to your house and find you and get you, get you back. And yes, we now have the lowest dropout rate in the history of Evanston Township High School. Uh, and, and, and we now have, uh, through the National Clearinghouse, uh, we can document that 84% of our students go on uh, uh, to college and university. Uh, that, that's a real number. I mean, that's documented that they have arrived at those colleges. And uh, remember, 84%, you might say, oh no, then we're missing 16%. No, we're not. We have kids who go to the military, kids who go to culinary school, kids who, go, who have this certification who go right into the workforce, kids who maybe had a job in high school and now they're in a management training position uh, where, where they've had their high school job. So that's just college. And then we have all our so many students going to so many other amazing opportunities. Well, it may not surprise you that we rank in the top 2% of all high schools in America when you hear what we offer here. That might look like 600, might look like a, 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 a an all, you know, 600th. Well, only 22,000 high schools even qualify to be ranked. And another 20,000 don't even meet the criteria to be ranked. So out of 35 to 40,000 high schools in America, we rank in the top two to 3%. Uh, that number 17 is kind of interesting. I love to tell this story. Uh, yes, we're 17th in Illinois. If you look at the high schools above, uh, ahead of us, nearly every one of them, or at least, nah, it's not true, at, at least half of them are magnet schools where you've got to take an admissions test to get in. And then lo and behold, the kids who get, uh, get in do well. What's interesting about uh, our ranking as number 17th is when you look at the schools that rank below us in Illinois, it's schools that you've maybe heard of, uh, like the Glen Brooks, uh, like Highland Park, uh, like Oak Park River Forest, uh, like Lake Forest. Oh, and did I mention New Trier ranks below ETHS in the national rankings? And then you can see, in, well, that's Washington Post, U.S. News and World Report, the exactly the same kind of thing. Um, uh, 
we're pretty pleased. Uh, we, we measure our students uh, on the ACT in Illinois. We, it's every student, not just the kids going on to college. We've been keeping track of this now for 43 years. And in 43 years, even today, with even the kids at the bottom of the class taking the ACT as part of our composite, we've nev never did that in the past. Uh, we have the highest, I really mean this sincerely, the highest ACT scores in the history of Evanston Township High School. And if you look at the subtests, English, reading, science, and math, we have the highest score, ACT scores in all those areas in the, in the history of, of, of ETHS. Um, uh, uh, also, you can kind of compare us. So while 61% of our students meet, meet the national readiness, uh, college readiness benchmark, uh, that's compared to a national 42, while 74% in English, that's compared to a national 64%. Um, um, I, uh, uh, also, this is pretty amazing. So 85% of our students uh, in the junior and senior year have been enrolled in at least one honors or AP class. Uh, you know, this is like, like woe be gone, where everybody's above average, uh, you, you know, not, not too bad. 79% uh, of our seniors, uh, uh, oh, let me pause and say that one, and, and then you can read the rest. So this past year, uh, uh, when our students walked across the stage to get their diploma, and remember, this is every kid. This is every kid. If we had a class ranking, this includes the kids who ranked, you know, last and next to last in the class. And yet, 79% of the students who walked across that stage had taken advanced placement courses. And I don't know if it's on the next slide, so I'll, I'll, I'll just point it out now. And 74% of those who took the exam got a three or higher, which could qualify them for a college education. Uh, uh, and get this, nationally, one in, internationally in fact, one in five people who take an AP exam score a three or higher. Nationally, internationally, one in five will score a three or higher. Even with opening the door to all those kids, one in two of our students will score a three or higher knocking the socks off of, of the national average. Um, so uh, uh, we've had some recognition. Here's an example. Uh, last spring, we were featured on the PBS NewsHour. Yes, we did make it to the national news on what we're doing on that. But I want to jump quickly and just share with you that we also are very determined to continue to keep the, the finances of this district strong. Uh, we've had seven straight years of a balanced budget. Uh, we uh, uh, have a capital improvement program uh, that uh, I hope you're, uh, those of you watching us, uh, the school at all, have seen the improvements that were, are taking place. Uh, our uh, retirement, uh, municipal employees retirement fund is uh, really funded well. I won't talk about the state's uh, teacher retirement system. Uh, and uh, we have a school board that places the highest value on strong fiscal management of, of this school district. We, uh, eight years ago, we earned a AAA rating. It was the first time in the history of ETHS, the only AAA rating this high school had ever earned, and we have now maintained that through eight year cycle. We have a AAA rating at ETHS. We get a lot of awards. Uh, they're national awards for distinguished budget, for uh, certificate of excellence in financial reporting, for, uh, uh, and we get these uh, from the most prestigious organizations in school finance uh, imaginable. As Paul said, we collaborate r r r deeply uh, with District 65. We have a joint literacy goal. We have ongoing collaborations, and uh, we continue to identify ways that the two districts can, can uh, uh, even more effectively collaborate. Uh, we have many ongoing partnerships, but I would like to lift up that uh, Northwestern University, uh, with President Shapiro's vision, uh, has really uh, committed to partnerships with ETHS. We uh, carved out a, a Northwestern University partnership office adjacent to the superintendent's office because we understood how important this is. Uh, uh, it is flourishing. We have amazing, deep, 
and important partnerships going on with NU. Uh, it's, it's mutually beneficial. We certainly benefit, but so do the students and faculty at NU who are able to, to interact with this world-class high school and these wonderful students. And it's, in fact, it has come to flourish so much that, that we've, we've had a full-time coordinator. Now we have, a, they have added another half-time position to assist because it's outgrown the one person who is housed in that uh, office. We do face challenges. Uh, uh, we do focus heavily on, on equity, uh, but we also understand that there are still disparities in achievement uh, that are predictable by race, and we know that, that until we have solved that, in spite of the great progress we've made, until we solve that, our work is not nearly done. We are striving to address the well-being of all students, and, 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 and we're also striving to make sure that all of our students feel a strong sense of belonging. We build relationship with students, we make it clear they belong here, and we make it clear that they belong in the best courses that we can possibly offer. Um, uh, we, we continue uh, to understand that we're going to have to face financial uncertainty with the state of Illinois, and we are really being nimble in, in not only assessing those threats, but working through solutions. Because I will tell you now, we will keep this district financially sound, no matter what the state of Illinois throws at us. And that's not gonna be easy, but I guarantee you, we will do that. And finally, we have some wonderful opportunities. I mentioned equity for all students. I just wanna point out this definition of equity. I think it's so important to understand it. But equity is really uh, uh, accounting for structural differences. We take a look at our policies, our practices, our procedures, our, our programs, uh, uh, what we've done historically and what we need to do in the future. We look at the best research and we are literally restructuring the high school. It's not a matter of adding more programs. Programs are great but programs don't achieve equity. We've initiated courageous conversations about race, and we know that unless we, we, we confront and, and openly talk about these issues and look for solutions we, and, and make the structural changes that are needed, we will never see those disparities solved. Uh, other opportunities, you've heard about Cradle to Career. Uh, uh, I've mentioned that we're, we're uh, working hard to build a 21st century learning environment. And as I've pointed out a few examples, a progressive uh, uh, curriculum as well. Finally, a couple of just advertisements. If you've not downloaded our mobile app, please do it. You can do it right now. Uh, normally, we, we encourage people, don't get out your cell phones while you're in class. Uh, uh, but get out your cell phone if you haven't done it already or, 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 or your iPad or whatever. And uh, uh, we would encourage you to search for the ETHS app and to download that. It is chock full of opportunities. We also uh, offer campus tours, and you can go to our website, find out when, when those are scheduled, and uh, get your name in. I warn you, they fill up. So if you're interested in one, get on that website, find out when we have some upcoming ones, and do it. And finally, it is my pleasure to introduce one of our retired teachers. When she comes up, you're going to say, that, that, that beautiful woman can't already be retired, uh, but, but, but our beloved retired math teacher, Janet Webb, and she'll explain the rest of the evening. Good evening. It's my pleasure to be here once again with you uh, to moderate this session, and it's hard for me to believe that this is my sixth year of retirement, and I'm enjoying it. <laughs> a number of questions were submitted prior to this event via Google Moderator, and we have those in hand, and we'll respond to several of them this evening. Uh, if you're in attendance tonight or watching from home, you can use your mobile device to submit questions. Simply text the keyword Evanston Schools 
all one word, to 22333 to join, and then start texting your questions. Or you can submit your question via the internet by logging on to the web address shown on the screen. And for those of you who are low tech, if you prefer pen and paper you have, and haven't had a chance to fill out an index card, raise your hand at this time and someone will come around with an uh, index card for you to fill out. We're not going to be here until midnight, so all of the questions will not be able to be answered this evening. All of the questions, however, will be reviewed and they will be responded to in an appropriate manner in a timely fashion. Okay, now that we've got that part out of the way, I have a question for both superintendents. The achievement gap continues to be a big focus in the Evanston community, yet little progress is being made after many years, and many programs and a lot of time and money have been spent. And this is a national issue, not just an Evanston issue. Why do you think your leadership and your programs and your efforts will produce measurable results? Okay. Oh, great. So let me start, and then uh, Eric, you, you can uh, chime in, please. A uh, couple answers to the question, and I appreciate the question. When we look at our strategic plan, we modeled the strategic plan after the seminal research from the University of Chicago that has uh, led to the development of what's called the five essential supports. The five essential supports will actually argue that if you have uh, high quality teaching and learning and a, a robust staff of principals, administrators, teachers, parent and community involvement, and a safe uh, student uh, uh, climate and a welcoming school uh, climate, as we've both expressed, that you have 10 times better chance of actually performing better and doing better on uh, the wide range of indicators that we have. So grounded in the strategies and the tactics that we have in our strategic plan is the research that is driving improved student performance. A second way to respond to the question is to be careful, and Eric just said this in, in his comments, to be really careful about programs and say, okay, program A, program B, program C, it's the silver bullet comment that I made uh, earlier in my comments, that programs don't actually lead to this, but strategies and commitments and ongoing commitments to really addressing the gap, being transparent about the gap, as we've done with our data, as you've done with the equity agenda that you have at, at uh, 202 that we have at uh, 65. So being very explicit about that. A third way to answer that is that the disparities and the concerns that we're facing in 65, we're addressing very specifically, as I suggested, in the very specific uh, uh, strategies and tactics that we're doing immediately now. Principals are setting their own performance goals for their schools. We're identifying a group of students who are not performing well, and we're gonna set performance goals and make sure that we're nurturing them and supporting them. And then finally, we're working hand in glove with our colleagues at 65. We know that um, close to 100 kids land at the high school and they're really struggling. They're really in need of intervention. They don't necessarily have the math and reading skills necessary. We find it very interesting that there are many children that arrive at kindergarten without the requisite skills. So what do we do as a school system? We identify that. We provide and prescribe interventions and then we work hand in glove with our colleagues in the high school to be able to identify other sorts of interventions, whether it's um, to address summer learning loss, whether it's to really nurture the middle schoolers as they're heading towards the high school, and so we work on all those strategies. Do we believe that that will make a difference? Yes. Um, are we committed to doing that? Yes. If we, uh, if we find that we have data that are telling us that we're not making as much progress, we will reflect and keep moving forward on what we will see as best practices. I don't know. Great. And and uh, kind of to spin off of what, what I had said when I was uh, walk, running through my slides, we are committed then to making structural changes to bring about the equity that will indeed close the achievement gap. Uh, we base it on research. There's a whole body of research, for example, about having a, a, a place to be a place of belonging. There's a whole lot of research about relationship building and what that means to a, to a young person's outcomes. But there's also a massive body of research about the importance of high expectations, a very challenging uh, and rigorous curriculum for students. 
And we actually know the research that that even has more benefit for African-American and Latino students than even for white students. The more rigorous, the more challenging you can make it, the more the stu our students will thrive. So we restructured our, our, our freshman year so that students are now in courses that are aligned uh, through very well thought out rubrics uh, all the way uh, to uh, advanced placement and college readiness. And then we mapped backwards to create a freshman experience to get kids to more honors courses, to more advanced placement courses, to, to, to more of the, the challenges that we have to offer. And I showed you that one slide, but let me put it in perspective. As recently as the 1990s, 11% of the students at ETHS were in advanced placement courses, and it was nearly entirely white. As recently as 10 years ago, we had far more than 11%. Than we we're probably running about 30 or, 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 or percent or so students taking AP classes, and it was still almost all white. And now today, all you got to do without all, even all the breakdown, when you know that 43% of the students in this high school are white and 79% of the students walked across that stage and had taken advanced placement, I think I'll let you know that we're making structural changes and letting students know you can do higher work, you can meet higher challenges, you belong in these classes, and we build a system of supports around our students so that we support them in plentiful ways in order to meet those higher expectations. And we also, in, in some of the changes that we're doing on curriculum, we have really exciting work going on at Shoot and at Willard um, and at Lincolnwood around culturally relevant curricula. So uh, Eric's point, which we absolutely embrace, that a kid needs to feel that they, um, that they have a place of belonging in their school experience. A family needs to feel that as well. And the rich interaction of our principals and our teachers who are working on really connecting to students of color, to all the students through the rich range of, of uh, curricular opportunities that can actually touch the lives of kids is gonna be really important and it's really, really exciting. Thank you. Our next question. This is for District 202. Since one of our collective prize goals is to prepare all students to graduate from college, how are we doing along these lines? Many schools and districts across the country utilize student-based data from the National Student Clearinghouse to track how their alumni do in college. Does ETHS do this? I'll answer it quickly so we can keep getting on to more questions. Uh, I pretty well referenced it earlier. Yes, we do use the National Clearinghouse data. It's based on real student numbers, real student identities, and real valid national uh, data. What percentage of our students showed up within one year of graduation to a two or a four year college? We know it's 84%. Uh, we also know as I mentioned, that that doesn't even account for all the other students going to other post-secondary, but I will just add this. We are adding another dimension to this. We also want to better understand how many go make it through college. It's two and through. We, we're, we, we want them to get to college. We want to know also how many make it through college. And so we're starting to, to gather and, and get that data and, uh, and we're looking at this whole concept of persistence. And those of you who went to college, whether you completed or didn't complete, I think you know how much persistence matters in college. And so what we're trying to do is figure out how that relates to our students and how can we, and by the way, if you ask me tonight, I can't tell you the answer to this question. We're researching it. But how do you build more persistence into young people by the time they graduate from high school. And, and sort of an unrelated but related point is that our research staffs actually this year on, on our behalf created a joint accountability report and the, the whole crux of it is to ask the question to what extent are children on track to graduate on time, to be successful and be college and career ready. Um, we're doing a little work with our colleagues at Northwestern University on this, but that's the sort of analysis that we're doing throughout both systems to have them ready for college and career. Yeah. Okay. Our next question is for both districts. What impact is the state of Illinois' budget impasses having on our schools? 
<laughs> Let me go first. Sure, go Stab us in the heart. Uh, we're really looking at, at, at enormous threats uh, from the state of Illinois. I don't think there would be anybody in the room who isn't seeing what all that's going on in our state, all the budget troubles. I see city officials here, uh, they're grappling with it you know, constantly. Uh, it is a statewide issue, as many of you know, the state has not had a budget now uh, for many months, and so far uh, it, it doesn't look like uh, the grand bargain is going to be cut anytime soon. Unfortunately, when it's cut, here are the kind of things that could happen to ETHS. They could shift all the pension costs that they've failed to pay over the years to our school district and we could lose about two million dollars. They could literally reallocate our special education funding. They are trying, they, the state board did this, and we'll lose about a quarter of a million dollars on that. In addition to that, they're now talking about equalizing education. Now, for probably 40 years, we've had a, an, a, 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 an unequal funding formula in the state of Illinois. But now that the state is broke, now they decide it's time to fix it when they have no money to fix the problem. And if they do what's being discussed, which would I call a Robin Hood approach, take money literally take it from the, the, the district, wealthier districts, and we, we are that in Evanston, and transfer it to the struggling and the, the, the less wealthy districts, many of them in southern Illinois, we would actually lose up to $2 million more in ETHS. If you were doing your math, I'm up to about, about four and a quarter million dollars and that doesn't even account with the fact that they're now talking about a two-year property tax freeze right. where we would not even be able to generate any new revenue and, and, and the, being bantered about for two years. How do we know what, what, what they'd do if they ever did it? And so com compound millions of dollars of money lost and a property tax freeze that could, could literally uh, uh, make it so we could generate no new revenue. It is possibly the perfect storm. In, in my public comments, I've said that this is like bowling in the fog, because if we're trying to do rational planning and set up a balanced budget and do what we are responsible to do as citizen, for the citizens of Evanston and Skokie, we, we don't know what's gonna hit us next. And the, uh, Eric's points, the. Um, the equalization formula shifting from high wealth districts to low wealth di districts has the potential of um, hitting us and diverting about $6 million off of our $124 million budget. Pension shifts of, is about $3 million, um, and the property tax freeze is somewhere between 2 and $3 million as well. Um, a week ago, a uh, headline of the Tribune says special education funds, as Eric mentioned, are going to shift into the general state aid. That's uh, about a $200,000 um, reduction for ETHS, and it's about a $450,000 reduction for us. So if you add those numbers up, um, that's a, a somewhere between eight and $12 million on $124 million. And so that, uh, the question is a honorable one, and the, the answer is that um, uh, it will have a significant impact on the operations of our school districts. And so part of what we're committed to do is to put our voice out, uh, to write joint letters, um, work with our school boards and our elected officials who care deeply about the quality of life in Evanston and Skokie uh, to be able to maintain, sustain, and grow all the great programs that are going on in both school districts. Um, but it's uh, that perfect storm feels like it's a coming. And as all of us know as citizens of Illinois, um, we're just waiting for them to get into the room to do the grand bargain, and then we're worried about whatever that uh, becomes. This next question came in through our modern day technology. What is the best way for out-of-state alumni to engage with current students and help prepare them for future educational and career endeavors? Oh, that's, a, that's great. We actually just had a conversation this morning. We're, we're carrying on, as I said, in our commitment to build um, a, a more diverse workforce, but also to improve our pipeline of teacher and teacher applica applications. Um, we were meeting with uh, representatives from uh, one of the local universities. And so as I listened to the question, it's, 
it would be fantastic to, especially for our alumni who are teachers or who are administrators working in the field of education, to, uh, to if they're in town, they live in town, they are coming to town, uh, to be, able, we'd be happy to welcome them into forums in our middle schools or even earlier to be able to, uh, to talk to, uh, um, uh, to our, our kids about the importance of thinking about education as a career. So that's one piece. The second one is uh, for alumni who are out there who, um, uh, who would like to participate, uh, we can coordinate uh, opportunities, especially in our middle schools, um, but also in our elementary schools on career days um, to be able to really deeply engage. So my email is gordonp at district65.net and I will respond to any alum who actually writes me and I'll welcome them into our schools and our district. Well, I'll piggyback on, on that last part first and say, uh, alums, wow. If you're listening in or if you're in the room and, and, and you feel compelled or, or, or motivated uh, or excited about uh, getting more involved, uh, we, we need you and, and we will welcome your help. Uh, probably the best way is, is you can either uh, send me an email, I'm real easy to find, uh, or also uh, we have an alumni association, you can find it on our uh, website, and you can contact them. They won't necessarily have all the contact, what they would do is gather information about your interest and, 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 and about what might uh, uh, be some, uh, some way you would want to participate, and then they could help us uh, and we could get it to the right, the right people. In the end, there are so many opportunities. And right now, I don't have all the layout, but we're really getting excited about trying to do something this summer with students who, who struggle in reading and have a loss of learning over the summer. And alums, if you'll let us know that you might have some level of interest in the coming few, a couple, three months, We'll at least be back in touch letting you know the kind of things we're trying to put together and see if you'd have any interest in helping us with that. And, and this is part of a joint conversation that we're having on uh, summer learning loss is such a significant piece of the achievement gap. And so if we can address that through the programs that we offer, through the social services that are available in the city, through a collaboration between both districts to be able to identify kids who may not have the opportunities, um, this would be spectacular for our alums, alums to join us. And you know, we, we all know that if you mentor a young person and you stay with that mentoring for more than a year, for a couple years at a time, it makes a significant difference in the, in the life course. And so to invite our alumni to come and help us on these uh, sorts of uh, ideas would be fantastic. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, this is for District 65. Why so many assessments? My daughter's teacher had to send a grid to parents with all of the upcoming tests, with the grades participating in a variety of assessments from January to May. Why are third graders put through seven assessments throughout this time period? How can this be changed? Um, uh, well, thank you for that question, and I, uh, uh, and I understand it dearly. A couple, uh, couple ways to respond. One is that we, we have, uh, but right now we have two assessments that are uh, uh, standardized tests that we use to gauge performance, much of the data that we provide, uh, both the MAP test, the NWA MAP test, and the PARC exam. And these are, the PARC exam is the state assessment that we, we um, must do, we're required to do. So we're running two of these at the same time. We didn't have a question about PARC. PARC is subject to a lot of controversy and a lot of debate. We don't know whether it will sustain itself over time. Until that decision is made, we are running two large standardized testing uh, batteries. And so um, that is part of how we get broader accountability and summative data so we know where we're going, how we're doing, and where we have to make uh, improvements. On the why so many tests at the third grade level for um, the young student, um, th those are more, many of those are formative assessments. These are assessments that teachers use to be able to assess how their child is doing, how their children are doing in class, where there need to be improvements, where there need to be some changes in the instructional process. So these sorts of formative assessments, which are on content area um, in the middle school or by grade level in the content areas in the, in the elementary school, are in many ways essential for continuous improvement, for understanding how kids are doing, and so that you can actually identify child by child, group by group in the class where we can make some changes. So that's the good side of assessment. 
the, the side that we have to actually pay attention to in our our team and our curriculum and instruction office is doing this, is how do we do the best to limit those, which is what the, um, the question is asking, so that we can, um, we can spend as much time in the process of learning and engagement around learning. A really good test is actually part of that engaged process. Um, but we would know that along with the large standardized tests and the formative assessments, that we have to do our best to condense them down. Thank you. Real quickly, I know that was a question about third graders, but Dr. Gorin is so right. I mean, we, we live in a, in a world of like maybe over-testing, over-assessment. Uh, assessment is not a bad word, but we deal with a lot of mandated things right now, and so we're trying to figure out how do we work within that context, do what we are required to do, uh, but, but also maybe try to bring a little reason uh, to, to sensible assessments. And uh, I actually, I, one of my grandsons is in third grade, yeah. so I, I understand what you Did you're you write that question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay, um, that is all the time we have, unless we'd like to stay here a little longer. I, I do think we've run out of time. Thank you very much, Thank both you. of you, for answering those questions. Mm -hmm. And again, all questions were not able to be answered this evening, but all questions will be read, looked at, and responded to in a timely and appropriate fashion. And again, thank you everyone who came out this evening. One of the beautiful things about working in Evanston is that as you look around this room, it's not just parents, it's grandparents and uncles and aunts because Evanston is a community that we all stay together, we remain together. And I just want to remind each of you that every morning, our parents send to our schools the best child they have at home. And they expect us to do our best to prepare those children for the future. So each one of us, each day as we go about, remember, this is the best child they have. They didn't keep the good one at home. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening.